Welcome to Conversations with Cox and Kielseth, and to be more specific, that is filmmaker Alex Cox and myself, film curator Pablo Kielseth. Alex will join us by phone from his home in Oregon while I sneak away from my office to call him from one of the projection booths used by the International Film Series, which has been screening foreign and independent movies at CU Boulder since 1941. We will keep our chats to about 20 minutes as we discuss whatever movie-related topics grab our fancy. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Beautiful, thank you. And yourself? Um, okay, a little anxious. Um, my cat's got some what might be cancerous tumors, so I'm waiting for a call back from the vet. But uh... oh God, how terrible! Well, I certainly hope that isn't the case. Yeah. How about you? How are you doing? Oh, I'm okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm just sitting here. Everything's fine, you know. Everything's yeah. I can't complain at all. I'm so sorry about the cat. Yeah. Well, um, but. How old? 16. 16, you see. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'll use I'll use my poor cat's health uh, to go go on to other issues regarding well, lack of health cuz I told you about how um Monty Hellman passed away and and that kind of made a splash this morning. Yeah. Um, and actually I I was I was reading the paper just after that and I saw that Richard Rush uh, the director of uh, Stuntman uh, also passed away, and they both Monty Hellman and Richard Rush were both ninety-one. They they were both the How same interesting. age. Interesting! Wow, and they died on the same day. Well, I, I don't know about the same day, uh, but I mean, obviously, uh, or actually, no, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, Richard Rush passed away on April eighth, and I've, I've I've read a couple different dates for Monty Hellman. Um, either the um, 18th or 19th or 20th. I saw the 19th in a hospital in Palm Springs. Yeah, I think that's probably the right one. Um, the other interesting thing about both Richard Rush and Monty Hellman is that uh, they both worked with Jack Nicholson. Yeah, specifically, Richard Rush worked with him on a, a biker picture called Hell's Angels on Wheels. It came out in 67. And that was two years before Easy Rider, of course, rocked the market um, and the, you know, cinematic worlds. Right. There was another one. I think there was one with Peter Fonda or, or with Dennis Harper, one of the two called The Glory Stompers. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I don't know about that one. There was, a, there was sort of a, 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 a several biker flicks hmm. um, done by Coleman and AIP. Yeah, uh, well, that's the other connection is you know, of course, Corman. Now, Richard Richard Rush. It's 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 a little strange because I really really like Stuntman, but I'm not familiar. I, I, I and I can't even. I think he also directed Freebie and the Bean and Getting Straight. And I I don't recall seeing either of those two. But uh, yeah, uh, the Stuntman is is a wonderful movie. Um, yeah, I I mean I when I was a teenager when I saw Freebie and the Bean and it was one of those films you know with like kind of stuff going on in the big city and cops. Wasn't and, it sort of a precursor to the the very popular buddy cop movies that then sort of got franchised later on? I think it was. I mean, as I recall, it was quite. But I don't remember it now. And, and as you say, I mean, apart from the Stuntman, Richard Rush didn't have a very very celebrated. Uh, filmography, um, I hope I'm not doing him an injustice, whereas Monty Hellman had several notable features. Sure. Um, I mean, for, for our listeners out there, um, Monty Hellman, of course, famously the director of Tulane Blacktop. Um, and uh, he, he got his start with Corman doing the, uh, what was it, the a Beast from the Haunted Cave. And then there's another um, haunted thing that he did a little bit of assistance with. He shot part of The Terror, which is that film that Corman did in two days. And then 
handed off to other people like Monty Hellman and Jack Nicholson to go go shoot a bit more of this. You know, is that the one that shows up in on the on the screen in Targets? Or yes. Is that, yeah. Nice. Yes. And uh, no, so so Monty Hellman in in the sixties worked with Jack Nicholson on uh, two films, uh, Backdoor to Hell and Flight. Flight to Fury, and I guess those were in the Philipp- shot in the Philippines, and they were back to back, which is something he that's, did. Ag- yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Like they did the westerns later. They did. Yes. Uh, they, I guess Roger sent Jack and Monty and a, a crew to the Philippines, and they made two war movies. Yeah. Now the the westerns, uh, those again shot back to back and on a, a total shoestring budget. It was just, I think it was like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You know, um, in a place that was later flooded. For um, but for the dam for the water Lake Mead, um, it was in a in a canyon that was soon to be inundated. So there was all kind of a poignancy about that. When the Blu-ray came out, didn't we see that one together? Um, uh, yes, we did. We watched the yeah. Blu-ray of it, and that's how yeah. we, that's how I that's how I know that it was shot in in a canyon, which is now Lake Mead. Yeah, but, but certainly of the two, I mean the uh, the shooting is a very interesting and uh, you know minimalist cowboy film. And I, uh, something to point out was that before he got into film, he was the first one of the first people to uh, do Waiting for Godot, I think, um, in uh, uh, I, I'm hoping I'm remembering that correctly. But that kind of makes sense when you think about the minimalism of both Ride the Whirlwind and the shooting. There, There is kind of this sensibility that seems to hearken to, um, you know, that kind of uh, presentation. And and also his kind of hooking up aesthetically with Rudy Wurlitzer, who had written novels prior to Tulane Black Blacktop, who'd written like Flats and Nog, which are very in that in that vein, in that Godoian vein. And who you worked with, of course, on Walker. On Walker, yes. And did you get a, Did you get a chance to call Rudy and uh, commiserate? I did. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, he was sorry that that old Monty had, had gone to his reward. I think Rudy had sent me a, like eleven years ago. He sent me a DVD of of uh, the last movie that Monty Hellman did. Road to but nowhere. There's actually, before we get to that, there was something yeah. about there was something up there. There was a confluence between Richard Rush and Monty Hellman as well because when. Easy Rider came out and was a big sensation. Universal tried to be like a hip studio for like for like about five minutes, and they and they paid for like five movies to be made for less than a million dollars by hip young directors. The first one was uh, the last movie, and Dennis Hopper took Richard Rush as a cast member to Peru to act in the last movie. And while they were down there, Monty Hellman started work on the second of the five pictures, uh, Two Lane Blacktop. Uh-huh. And so there's so so all it's a you know, that was their world and they all came out everybody came out of Corman. Everybody came out of Corman, you know. The, right. All the directors of, of those films and Well, we're both fans of the, the the last movie. We saw such a nice print of that up in uh, Munzinger, the International Film Series. I wonder if we'd be able to access that one again. And then you did a I documentary we could. about we could that. Borrow it yeah. from the uh, from the Hopper Foundation. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very nice print. What was it? And your documentary, wasn't it sort of a behind the scenes on it? What was that one? I called? made a documentary uh, with interview, interviewing people who've been involved in it many years later called Scene Missing, which you can uh-huh. find on the Internet or on the Blu-ray or the DVD of the of the recent re-release. But yeah. that was the first of the films that were part of this sequence. It was also Diary of a Mad Housewife, directed by Frank Perry and Tulane Blacktop. And so... It, it, obviously, after the last movie was viewed as being a, uh, a failure, then the studio turned against all the other films as well, including um, including Two Lane Blacktop, which is a pity because it, it's a very strong and interesting film. Uh, it a, is. A, a sort of a, an existential rural road movie. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll never forget the – it's it's one of those moments where you, you'll, you see the film burn up in the gate – Right. Yes, um, yes. It ends with the film catching on fire in the gate, which is very, also very existential, yeah. um, uh, especially for the film itself. But the um, I, the character of Warren Oates in that film is so good and so funny and so strong, so much of a counterpoint to the other protagonists who are rock and rollers, uh, you know, very laid back kind of guys, yeah. you know. Um, but but Oates is so big and strong. 
you know, just a strong performance of a very of a of a, of, of, of a very weak but aggressive character called GTO. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful portrayal. And then he followed it with an even greater performance for Monty Hellman in a movie called Cockfighter. Yep, that's that's a very uh, gritty. Th- that film definitely gets under the skin, and um, and it's it's probably one that I don't know that I could show in Boulder, but uh, I I do admire it. The thing is, I mean, I mean, it was originally it was far less bloodthirsty. It didn't have all of those scenes of cockfighting. It just had this amazing performance from Warren Oates, who doesn't speak at all throughout the movie. He takes a yeah. vow of silence, doesn't say a word till the very end. And great supporting performances. Harry Dean Stanton is in it, and and but and and they screened it. And and this is a terrible thing that one of the most terrible things that Roger Corman ever did because he was the producer, the the financier, and he goes, "This film isn't working. I need to have it." You know, it's we, we we test marketed it, and it's just not it's not playing, and so he he tasked John Davison to shoot a whole bunch of cockfighting scenes and insert them, you know. So all of this horrible, gruesome stuff was added by by Corman uh, after after Monty Hellman delivered the film, and John Davison came up with a new advertising campaign for the film. He came to town with his cock in his hand. <laughs> Now, this is your friend John Davison of uh, RoboCop fame, right? Or- and, and the producer of Starship Troopers, yes, yes. He was a wonderful person and yeah. the nicest, nicest man. But that was just his job was to make <laughs> Cockfighter <laughs> controversial. Whereas before, what Monty had done was, it, I guess if you could ever see the original version, it's like a very sensitive, nice, intelligent <laughs> film you know which then got banned in england it couldn't be shown in england because of animal cruelty and stuff and and yeah um, yeah how these these producers and financiers man they it's the things they do well now speaking of that because because uh now i've seen cockfighter and i've seen two lane blacktop with war notes but war notes was also in monty hellman's china nine liberty 37 which i have not seen have you seen that one i have seen that and that's an Italian Western directed by Monty Hellman, starring Fabio Testi, Warren Oates, and Sam Peckinpah. Oh, wow. And, and so you'd think, oh, man, it could be the greatest film in the world. Uh, as I recall, it isn't really, it isn't a really, really great film, but it's got some moments and Warren Oates needless to say Warren Oates is very good in it Warren Oates is very good in everything he he did there should be a Warren Oates film festival at some point or a retrospective oh, right that would be great yeah I mean there's a Harry Dean Stanton fest you'd think there'd be a Warren Oates fest as well yeah I know bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia would be uh one of the uh, films to toss in there for sure along with so many others yeah yes but there's one uh, th- there's a picture that was taken on the set of China 9 Liberty 47. Uh, it's a very famous picture, which you can see if you go to Monty Hellman's IMDb page and scroll down a bit and click on one of the alternate pictures. And it's a picture of a set visitor. They were on set and there's, there's Sam Peckinpah in his, cow, in his cowboy costume and the cinematographer, Giuseppe Rutono, I think, and Monty Hellman and Sergio Leone. Whoa. Leone has come to the set. And so Peckinpah did meet Leone, like King Kong did meet Godzilla. The two <laughs> people actually were in the same space. Wow. F- at least on one occasion. And what's the other director who gets to be in the picture? Monty Hellman. Wow. <laughs> so isn't that a piece of fanboy trivia? That is great fanboy trivia. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for that. Yeah, and uh, I guess it was on set. I guess they were shooting the thing in the studio in Rome, and Leone just came by, and it must have been around about the time they were doing uh, Duck Yusaka because he's he's not very, very big, but he's pretty big, and he's got his beard, and, and uh-huh. he's looking good, you know. And Peckinpah's there, and kind of almost in awe, you know. It's interesting. So that's on IMDb. I'll have to look that one up. Just it's a still. 
It's a, it's a, just a still from uh, that somebody took. It's been it's a photocopy of something that was published in the Directors Guild magazine many years ago. Well, and then and then Monty went on in the eighties to do a horror film, which to my surprise I have not seen, even though I love horror films. Silent Night, Deadly Night Three, Better Watch Out! Exclamation mark. Which I guess according to Variety, Hellman quote admitted was probably his worst film end quote. Um, but uh, he was still very proud of the fact that he basically shot the whole thing in just a few weeks' time and um, brought it in on budget. So and he would do that. I mean, to, because I, the studios wouldn't hire him after Universal turned against him, but he still worked for Corman and he did like Iguana was another kind of horror horrory film, wasn't it? So he could always revert to beast from the haunted cave and, and, and stuff when it was necessary right yeah. well you know but that's what's interesting too is that the the two uh, westerns that were presented in one blu-ray package that we saw ride the whirlwind in the shooting even though they they were were shot on a, like just absolutely zero budget you know they were not successful movies and and only only by dint of their basically being circulated in a whole bunch of different markets, uh, international markets and TV, you know, um, uh, just being shown on different TV stations at different times. It eventually, those films eventually found their audience. And I think also, obviously, it helped that Jack Nichol as Jack Nicholson's star was uh, ascending um, uh, some some curious folks. Yes, kind of his check presence it out. is, of course. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes a big difference for the video box, doesn't it? But they're but they're both great movies. I mean, those are uh, you know. I mean, if if any three, if, if if well, it's it's gosh, it'd be four movies that I would probably tell. You know, it's like you got the Tulane Blacktop and then Ride the World when the shooting and uh, the Cockfighter. I think those are the the four that I'd put at the top. I'd throw in Road to Nowhere, his last movie too, which I actually really enjoyed. A kind of a very cynical film about how messed up film finance is. Well, no. I, and I, my understanding is that, yeah, that's it's billed as a he did he, that was released in 2010, so 11 years ago, and it's he was 80 years old when he made that. Well, it, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's 2021, and he was 91, so that that math works out. But um, uh, you know, you gave me the the DVD because I think someone gave it to you. You passed it along to me. I think Rudy gave it to me. Uh, oh, yeah. all right. Well, uh, I actually was wondering why I never finished it. So I put it back in the, um, you know, I, I, I tried playing it today, got halfway through. And yeah, it's, I could see why he would consider it a very autobiographical film. It's very much about, you know, people making a movie and, uh, you know, the, the guys falling in love with the star and uh, all kinds of, you know, sort of behind the scenes shenanigans. But you also get to see the movie. It's uh, the movie as parts of the dailies are screened or the DVD is screened halfway through my screening of it, it glitched out. And that's when I remembered, that's why I never finished watching it because the, the disc I got for some reason, I just had a scratch, I think somewhere along the line. So I'm going to have to find a, find a, another, another copy, but I'll finish it up. Cause this, especially if you're recommending it, I think it also won an award, didn't it? Um, at the, uh, I, I don't know, but I think it, I thought I found it very entertaining and funny um, and ironic and cynical. Yeah, it, it actually, yeah, yeah it it, uh, it played at South by Southwest and um, got uh, some accolades at the Venice Film Festival. Um, but so, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I need to finish that. Uh, he's, uh, and I, I should also add that I, for some reason, I was Facebook friends with Monty Hellman, and uh, I used to see posts from him all the time. And he seemed like the most accessible, nicest guy on the planet, and just um, he seemed to always be looking for. Uh, tenants to um, uh, he must have had a nice house somewhere. I, I vaguely recall seeing some pictures, and it seemed like uh, he'd be renting out one of the you know uh, one of the rooms <laughs> or something. <laughs> that would have been fun. Any uh, God, can you imagine being a fanboy, being able to just like uh, hang out and you know sit by the pools, hearing you know stories from Monty Hellman? That would have been awesome. <laughs> yeah. To each his own. <laughs> yeah. Well, but he also did, you know, he did other stuff too. I mean, because he, he was always kind of busy doing different things. I, I think uh, if I recall, he was also a, looking at some notes here. He was a dialogue director for Corman's um, The St. Valentine's Day Massacre uh, from 1967. Uh, he did second unit stuff on RoboCop. So there you go. There's um, he's, oh, he's working with your buddy again. Oh, because he knew John, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Credited as an editor on The Wild Angels uh, from 1966. And uh, 
We also did a little bit of work with Peckinpah on the Killer Elite uh, 75. So, he, you know, he was he was back there, um, obviously. Oh, yes. I mean, he, you know, I, mean, I, mean I t- it was it was unfortunate in a way. He was rather like Dennis Hopper because their foray with Universal was like, because, because the studio turned against them and they couldn't direct for the studios anymore. They were essentially blacklisted by the studios and had to go back to Corman and find money individual, I mean, in, in, independently. And so yeah. it definitely gave their films an independent vibe. Um, right. But also I think that they probably would like to have worked more, more frequently. Yeah. But he was still, I mean, it's amazing that he was still directing films when he was 80. Good for him. He must have really been enjoying himself. Well, but also like you, he also had a, a, a tenure working as a teacher at, um, at, at a university. He was at California Institute of the Arts. Oh, Cal Arts. That right. He, that's right. He taught at Cal Arts. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and he was also the executive producer of, uh, uh, or an executive producer of Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs as well. Yeah. Well, well, hell. But you know what? Uh, two, two, two uh, interesting directors both um, managed to have a nice long road of, um, you know, and a record of uh, interesting work. So, old American directors from the new American cinema of the nineteen sixties and seventies. Yeah, I'm going to raise my uh, beer now, and uh, you know, uh, rest in peace to the to the both of them, to Monty Hellman and. Richard Rush. Cheers. Here's to the Monty and Richard. Cheers. Yep. To, to Monty and Richard. And um, oh, and also to I used yeah. to I, I had a very nice gaffer friend called Sean Madigan who died last week. He was oh. the gaffer of um, a bunch of stuff that I did, and he was also the head grip on uh, Straight to Hell. So he's also gone to his reward. So this is for Sean as well. Cheers, Sean. All right. Cheers, Sean. And. Um, well, let's uh, let's wrap it up for today. And, uh, you know, thanks as always for joining me. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for chatting and we'll speak more. All right, Alex. Thanks as always. Say hi to Todd for me and we'll talk next week. Will do. All right. Ciao. And cut. Okay, that's a wrap. Thanks again for joining Alex Cox and myself today. I'd like to thank Jason Phelps for handling the audio and Ted Thacker for letting us use the intro to his song, The Ballad of Slim Cessna, for the musical cues that bookend these conversations. And if you'd like to contact us, please email pablo at internationalfilmseries.com.